please. Okay, uh, thanks a lot, Anton. So, uh, you know, uh, uh, it's always been a great pleasure to discuss uh, with, uh, with Anton about open science and things like that. I mean, uh, heart is in the right place, lots of subjects of discussions, lots of interesting input, feedback and stuff like that, always very much valued. So uh, I'm kind of very happy for the chance to do this presentation today and hoping to kind of broaden the discussion to include more of you. Um, the idea is that I'm going to take some time to maybe tell you about the basics of what SciPost is and how it's run, how it's built, uh, etc., where it's going. Uh, you've got a menu of uh, subjects that I would like to cover. Uh, some of those things uh, we can uh, maybe jump over, like if you're not interested in the business context and what uh, the kind of financing model is, stabilization model, etc., then I can I go over that. Otherwise, what I'll do, I'll just bulldoze my way through these things relatively, I mean, I hope relatively quickly, and then we can come back to any of these themes that you want to discuss. Um, so, uh, so I, I mean, I'm not quite sure. I can never assume that everybody knows what SciPost is about, so I'll just give you a one-minute summary of what it is. The idea is that it's meant to be a complete publication system. So everything that academics need in order to do the publishing process in all its steps and facets uh, is within the remit of what SciPost does. Um, the important thing is that the people who run it, the people who really determine uh, you know, how it's built, where it's going, etc., are professional scientists. So professional academics, people with, with you know, jobs, stable jobs in the, in the field. So really a grassroots thing, and I really intend on keeping it that way. And what do we offer? Well, primarily it's a set of uh, publication venues. So it's got journals, of course, because we have to fit in the ecosystem as it is today, but we try to go beyond that. We try to facilitate commenting on, on, on existing literature. We're also working quite a lot in the background on technological aspects, like for example, metadata services that one day will, uh, uh, will finally be in a state to release that you can then use to facilitate your research on certain things. And if you had to summarize the whole thing in two words, it would be openness and quality. So we uh, use the concept of openness to try to leverage for more quality in, in, the, uh, uh, in the publishing world. So, so what do we aim to achieve? Again, this is quite easily stated, but quite frankly, we, we want to have a rather complete reform of publishing at all levels, be that, I mean, preprints are working quite well for physics. It's not the case for all other fields, but after you're done with the archive, then starts the kind of rodeo of things that don't re really uh, uh, always work well. So we try to do that. And our, um, our idea is that we try to implement open access, but in a very broad definition of what that means. And that's what we call genuine open access. So it's essentially that you, uh, uh, you try to open up the machine at uh, more or less all levels, all meaningful levels become accessible. Uh, you wanna know about the finances. There's nothing kind of uh, hidden behind closed doors. There are no shenanigans with finances and whatnot. Uh, we try to follow a strict editorial financial decoupling in everything that we do. We try to throw any form of profit making out the window to make sure that it doesn't pollute the scientific process. Uh, we don't like uh, article processing charges that's being that are being installed as the new business model for publishing, namely uh, essentially like author pays uh, uh, if you want, although technically you have to be careful with the definitions, but the idea that you would do the work uh, 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 and then pay to have it published, it's not something that we want. We view publishing much more as an infrastructure of academia, uh, as the desk and the chair that you have at your university, your library and stuff. The process of publishing belongs to the academic community in that sense, to the infrastructure of the academic community. So what we're trying to do is convince universities to fund a thing like SciPost as an infrastructure for academia. Um, we want to really change a bit the refereeing procedure and make it more open, give much more credit to the work of referees by making these things citable, you know, visible, much more than in, uh, than in other things. And we're trying to also streamline the feedback that people can get after the publication, because going a little bit towards the software industry where things are really alive, much more alive than these static publications. But we can talk uh, in more detail about that later if you're interested. Finally, when our you know, metadata engines will be released and whatnot, we also want to drive a wedge in the existing uh, impact assessment uh, that's based on you know, citations of publications and whatnot. We want to make that a much more informed process by making this information available for those who want to use it. Okay, genuine open access. I invite you to look at the site on the about page. You'll have a description of what this is all about. But essentially, if you you know uh, look at the ceiling and think a bit about the kind of 
uh, uh, most morally acceptable way of doing all these things, you're probably going to come up with more or less exactly this uh, this list here. Uh, so you can yeah, you can have a look at that later. Um, so here's the here's the homepage actually, uh, which uh, I, I proudly style in the 1990s style. So you know proudly defended by the archive.org. Uh, we're about to change the homepage anyway, so it's going to be slightly modernized, but just to say that I, I like this type of uh, web design where you, uh, you have a very sober design where people go to the content that they need by you know, a few clicks, a few useful uh, things, a machine that works well, and that's it. No big white space with lots of meaningless images and things like that. You're not going to find that here. This is about scientific content. Um, there are a couple of interesting news in there. So uh, the NWO just recently gave us a bit of money finally to pay a programmer. So I might be able to sleep a tiny bit more. Uh, uh, so this is going to be about broadening the, uh, the base of SIPOS to really facilitate um, uh, the installation of journals and publishing processes in different fields of academia. And this, uh, that, pro that project is going to be running during the year uh, 2022. Um, also, you know, in terms of volume of publication, we're doing quite all right. The first publication was in September 2016. So in five years, we've crossed now the bridge of uh, 1,000 publication. So we're quite happy with that, actually, because we have used extremely minimal resources to this. And if you want to compare, for example, there's the welcome open uh, uh, research that you might know as a publishing framework. They've also started more or less at the same time we did. They've also just crossed the border of a thousand publications, but you can look at the orders of magnitude difference in the resources that are used for one or the other. So SciPost is also demonstrating that publishing does not have to cost a fortune. Um, the journals that we have, so uh, these are the prime uh, journals in physics that we have. We also have some other journals in other fields of academia. Like I said, you know, we just crossed the border of a thousand publications. A lot of the uh, uh, volume is for SciPost Physics, which is our flagship. This is by far the uh, up to now uh, largest journal that we have, although we're trying to uh, uh, re-equilibrate things a bit. We've got a lot of proceedings also uh, being published uh, very much in high energy. Um, uh, we've also started a code basis journal that's going to be published also partly on our Git server on the side, but we can talk about the details of this if you're interested uh, later on. Um, the editorial workflow at SciPost is different than the one that you're used to. Uh, the first aspect of it uh, is that it's open in the sense that the refereeing occurs uh, uh, witnessed by the community. So people will see the contents of the reports as they come in. Uh, uh, and then, uh, yeah, so, I mean, that, that's the first extremely important and different aspect, especially in physics, we're not really used to this, so we're trying to push this. That said, in other fields of academia, uh, open refereeing has been used for two decades, so physicists are by far not innovators here. Uh, it's one of the things I, I usually like to say about physicists, they think that they're so far ahead of the curve with archive, but archive is 30 years old and things have moved on quite a lot, quite a lot since then. And I think in the meantime, uh, physicists have been relatively, you know, um, uh, conservative in their experimentation with reform of publishing. So we're trying to bring some movement in there. Uh, so open refereeing is a, a very important thing. Um, another important thing is that besides invited referees, people who are registered contributors at SciPost can volunteer uh, a report. And to be a registered contributor, you just have to be an active academic of at least PhD level and above. Uh, then we just check that you are indeed, you know, involved in research and you know what you're talking about. And then you've got the right to voluntarily uh, submit reports and comments to uh, submissions or even publications. Uh, once they've been uh, published, you can put comments on this. And these uh, invited and contributed reports are um, taken into consideration when making the decision. And the way the decision is made is also um, uh, uh, communal within a set of uh, academics that we call fellows. So we have so-called editorial colleges, a kind of synonym for editorial board in other journals. But we like, we like the idea of a college, it's more collegial, so we call it that. And uh, these fellows are really, you know, very knowledgeable, uh, very high reputation people working in the field that really are able to assess uh, the feedback that's been received on submissions. And then the um, final decision, which is based on the recommendation of the fellow that takes charge of the submission, the final decision is taken by voting at the editorial college. So there's not a single editor that has sufficient power uh, 
to accept or refuse a manuscript. This is always a communal driven decision by the fellows of the editorial college. So this is also a kind of very different process than uh, the one you'll have uh, in other places. Again, later on, if you want to discuss the details of the editorial process, I'm very happy to show you, uh, you know, uh, much more deeply how it works. Um, so, you know, roadmap. Uh, well, like I said, we started in 2016. Uh, it was a slow start, of course, because you have to establish things from scratch. We start new titles. We don't take over existing titles. And then it takes essentially years before the reputation of, su of such a thing is built. I think by now, Cypost Physics has, you know, been recognized for a bit. The other journals are also catching up in that sense. Uh, we're starting activities now uh, uh, more intensively in uh, chemistry. Uh, astronomy also, we hope to do some progress on this. For the moment, we're really kind of focusing on chemistry these weeks to, to really get it going. We've got a, a small kernel of an editorial college going, so we're trying to, uh, to get that done. Um, uh, and then also, I was talking about uh, this journal on code bases that we want to scale up, the metrics that we'll have with our metadata engine. So this is maybe developments for the coming year. In the longer, inter in the longer term, also facilitated by this uh, this grant from the NWO we just got, we're going to want to try to at least offer the possibility to academics in different fields to use the machinery that we've built in order to also operate journals in their own fields. Uh, so this is, for example, the set of fields that was required for a uh, call for tenders from the European Commission for an open publishing platform that was, uh, uh, that was financed a couple of years ago. Uh, but, you know, so SciPost is built uh, field agnostic so you could run it also in these different areas, provided you use editorial processes that are similar to the ones that are uh, you know, hard coded in. So we'll see where we are over five years, but that we'll take it step by step on this. Um, so the, uh, uh, the technology behind it, this is something that I've got very much at heart because you know, I, I might be a theorist, but I'm a bit of a practical geek as well. Uh, one of the reasons I kind of had so much fun building SciPost is because at least at the beginning, I viewed it as a big challenge to try to see if such an infrastructure could be built, just to demonstrate that indeed it was not like putting a man on the moon. It was much simpler than that. It was not really rocket science. Uh, so to prove that, you know, uh, what better way than to take an idiot like me uh, with his, uh, uh, his butt on his armchair, just uh, coding, learning how to code and, and just doing it. And indeed it's happened. So you see, it's not rocket science. Um, everything which is um, built for SciPost is based exclusively on free software. I'm a bit of a purist on this actually. Uh, so uh, uh, the tech stack, we use open frameworks that exist, but most of the stuff is really built by hand from scratch. Uh, so we, we use a lot of free and open source software. Sometimes we contribute some patches to these things when, uh, when needed. Uh, if you're a bit into web programming, you'll probably have heard of a few of these, uh, uh, these things here that are used either for back end, front end and whatnot. There are new technologies that are being developed. If you're a bit of a techie as well, I'll be very happy to tell you what I think of the difference between these big JavaScript frameworks, I'll have you.js and HTMX. HTMX is like my new fad. Um, I think it's really the future of web programming, which is showing up here. And we're trying to be like uh, pioneers in uh, installing that. Uh, so again, I'm happy to, to talk about this. So separately from cypos.org, we also have a repository uh, a server where we put our code base for preservation and we put lots of other things for our operations. Uh, it's a GitLab instance at uh, git.cypos.org. And then we use lots of internal other technologies for doing this and that. Again, uh, I, could, uh, I could give a week uh, course on the technologies behind web programming here. It's really quite a, quite a big stack. Um, in terms of deployment, uh, so SciPost uses a number of uh, different machines for doing different things. Um, uh, that's kind of a simplified diagram of how things look. There's SciPost.org, which is the central machine on which all, all the editorial processes run and everything is, is kept. Um, we've got uh, the git.cypos.org instance where we preserve the, uh, the code base, like I said, but also we'll start pushing uh, things like uh, proofs there. We'll also do some content preservation on this instance there. We've got centralized authentication between all the, all the systems here also with our discourse discussion server that was really created and installed at the instigation of Anton uh, in there. And then we've got separately uh, 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 testing staging server, and we've got the big beast, the XMeta metadata engine, 
uh, which is built as a separate infrastructure that's going to come online, hopefully within the next uh, 12 months. Uh, sometimes things get quite complicated. So one of the things that we have to be particularly uh, careful with is of course, email communication. So, you know, we've had to construct some very elaborate things here. So this is my madman's take on how to properly do email in this modern day and age when you're trying to, uh, you know, leverage all the technologies. But again, I, I'll spare you the details on that unless you're interested. You can find all the code base for SciPost on git.sipost.org. Just go there and you can pull the code if you want to. And if you find your way through the spaghetti, you can even run the instance on your laptop if you want. You're not going to get any data. You're not going to get any content, but you're going to get the skeleton of uh, everything that's in there. So, so you can see everything that, uh, that is being pushed to production there uh, and see. And if you happen to know a bit about web programming, we'd also welcome your contribution to this. The idea is that this is always going to be perpetually open. We follow the idea of open software as secure software, it's improved software. So, you know, hopefully this is going to uh, allow it to preserve and grow and really uh, get polished in the proper way in the course of time. Okay, um, so, so that was for the technical bit. Then um, maybe I'll spend a few minutes to talk about some other, I think, important side of SidePost that uh, is trying to reform how things are done. It's about the business of, uh, of publishing. And here, I, I usually like to make lots of jokes on this because uh, at the beginning when I, uh, uh, when SciPost was growing a bit, I was kind of being accused of being like a completely illusory uh, socialist communist and whatnot, and it would be uh, completely crazy. And then tell people, no, 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 you get me completely wrong. I do love markets. I'm North American. I grew up in Canada and Quebec. And uh, like I told them, I, I even trained as a stockbroker. So I know how a market works. I kind of know the excitement of it. I know, I, I know when, it work, uh, when it works well, it's great. Um, the problem is that, you know, markets work well, uh, but only uh, uh, when they do work well. They don't work well and they don't work well. And there's one uh, circumstance in which you don't have a properly functioning market, and that is certainly scientific publishing. And for this, again, I kind of published a cynical piece on this, uh, an allegory on uh, Jonathan Swift, uh, uh, an old Jonathan Swift essay. You can have a look at this here, where I make actually a concrete proposal for how you'd want to run a market in scientific publishing. And then uh, maybe if you read that, uh, you'll, uh, you'll see where I stand. So the way I view it is that uh, publishing these days has really become a, a prime example of this kind of failed capitalism, which is propped up by a kind of socialistic side. So you've got governments, universities really trying to do good for science and for the general population, but they're kind of shackled by these, you know, uh, uh, these systems that just suck the money out of them. Yeah, and these systems are really optimized, deliberately designed to suck the money out of these flows here. So I think it's really a case of a failed market. You're not going to start marketing your paper after it's published. It's immovable. You can't do anything with it. You're locked in. And if you, if you have like lock-in like this, you don't have a properly functioning market. So that just doesn't work. Reforming it is, of course, contingent on offering a viable alternative uh, for it. So, uh, uh, um, so in terms of... Yes, yeah, sorry. There's a question via chat. Um, yes, so the question I, don't, is I, I don't see the chat, so you'll have to... Yeah, right, uh, I'll read it for you. So yeah. since old practices are used both by for-profit and non-profit publishers alike, uh, is the funding model a big problem at all? Uh, uh, in, in that as long as there's cash available, does it matter how it was obtained? Um, so so uh, does the question about the funding model being problematic apply to SciPost or more generally? No, uh, to, to, to the traditional uh, so, so to the to the traditional uh, funding models. Yeah, so so the, uh, the, uh, the funding models are in great movement, right? Because so they were uh, subscription based until you know relatively recently, and now they're moving more and more towards this author pays model. Although this transition is kind of arrested somewhere in between, most of the new article processing charge based journals are really new journals. There are a few that are transitioning into that, but many are these new journals that do that. So you're kind of uh, developing multiple header here. Um, one of the reasons why the, old, the whole open science movement was started in the first place was that there was a realization that there was way too much money flowing into the pockets of publishers. And there was a great incentive to reduce costs Reducing cost was really, if you go back 20, 22 years to the discussions on open access there, um, I think it would be one of the three main reasons why you would want to, uh, uh, to do the reform. 
However, the publishing industry, mostly the corporate publishing industry, has played their cards uh, very smartly on this because they said, okay, fine, you're going to get open access if the money is guaranteed at, as you cross the door at the entrance. And I think what the academic sector and the you know, funding agencies and things uh, failed to anticipate was that this would be used to reset the level of expenditure to a much, much, much higher level. And then there was the installation of the first uh, open access journals based on APCs and uh, quickly prices went through the roof. And then somebody made a calculation that said, okay, it's all fine to publish a few percent of papers with these APCs. But if we were to publish hundred percent of our papers with these costs here, then we would have multiplied the expenditure uh, by a very large positive factor, which was not the intent uh, because the intent was to, to reduce it. So I think uh, uh, if I am to, uh, um, uh, 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 if I am to look for a word uh, uh, about current business of publishing in terms of the money flow, it's it's one really major snafu. Yeah, it's really, really, really uh, gone completely wrong. And uh, I think this represents a major financial risk for the funders, the universities, uh, etc. But of course, the uh, you just need to look at the yearly reports of the publishers over the last few years and you'll see the growth rates we're talking about here. So they are very happy. Yeah. So I don't know if that answer the, uh, answers the question of the chat, but... <laughs> can I, can I um, ask a related question then based on that yeah. explanation? Sorry. Um, so th there's a bit of a chicken and egg problem there, right? So if you set the price is too high, then people <laughs> you know, don't have the money to pay. And so the number of articles that are published that way is going to remain low. Um, and um, I guess this is partly where SIPOs can come in or things like that can, can come in to lower that barrier for, for many more people. Is, uh, what is your view on that? It's, it's uh, more or less exactly what uh, I would like SIPOs to achieve on the side of business, on the side of expenditures, because you see uh, inflation of APCs is really going at above you know, 10, 20% a year. Uh, and you have singular moments where these are increased to, uh, to very high levels. And it's very difficult to extrapolate in the future how it goes. However, already even with the current situation, the librarians who try to make a forecast of their expenditures on APCs immediately see that they are going to go bankrupt uh, within a couple of years if it stays at that rate. And if increasing number of people use the uh, you know, APC reimbursement facilities that are offered to them. Now, the, um, uh, uh, the hope of the publishers is that they will develop new money streams for this. And there is one very important and new money stream which is starting to be used extensively. And that is to put publishing costs in your research grants. Um, so uh, uh, so uh, this means that this is additional money as compared to the library budgets that can flow again directly into the pockets of the publishers. So this is a way whereby the publishers have managed to really convince the academic community to stab itself uh, in the back and use the precious money for research to pay for publications like this. So, um, uh, uh, so this is the great danger and that's why I say uh, uh, to any of you academics putting publishing costs on your research grants, you will not get my vote. So I, I really don't think you should do that. I think you should blank refuse to do this. Research money is research money. It is not meant to pay for publishing because there is sufficient money in the existing library budgets worldwide to run a full scale infrastructure for publishing without any problem. And um, uh, in that sense, this is where I try to position SIPOs to, you know, put my money where my mouth is, because I want to show that it's possible because we're doing it. <laughs> and if people were going to switch to infrastructure like this, then the budgetary constraints on libraries would be resolved. The uh, research money would stay research money. And the only losers would be, of course, the corporate publishers running uh, their own systems there. But this is, uh, this is a very, very difficult battle to wage 
because it is so deeply entangled with the question of reputation and of evaluation systems that we have, promotion systems, granting systems, and whatnot. We still rely very much on the high impact journals uh, as determined by organizations like Clarivate Analytics running Web of Science, Elsevier itself running Scopus and things like that. We have to divorce ourselves from these systems. We have to come up with our own alternatives here. So, 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 so that's the crazy suicidal plan of SciPost. We're gonna build the infrastructure for publishing at scale. That's going to cost much less. We're going to build the metadata infrastructure necessary for you to do any form of evaluation you want if it's based on usage. And then you can throw the publishers out the window and you can throw the evaluators also like Web of Science, Scopus, out the window um, because uh, they hold a stranglehold on emerging initiatives so as us. It's very easy for Scopus to cut the competition from SciPost because they just don't list SciPost in their, in their systems. And then we don't count. And then academics who publish with us in principle don't get their promotion. Uh, so that takes a certain amount of behind the door kicking and screaming in order to sort out, which I'm very happy to do. But, uh, uh, but it's, it's, not, uh, it's not a fair game. Yeah, so, uh, so what I would like is that at some point there's a recognition coming from the universities, the funding agencies, that indeed the SIPOS template works and that they put their weight behind it so we can properly scale it up and offer a much greater variety of, uh, of things here. But this moment has not come yet. It's starting to trickle a bit, but the, uh, uh, we're talking, uh, we need two orders of magnitude more resources poured into our way in order to be able to make a significant difference. I don't know if that's kind of answering your question, but. Uh... Yeah, great, yeah, thanks. Okay. Okay, so, uh, so anyway, uh, uh, we've already talked business. I guess we've made some important points on, on this. So let me just uh, then skim through these, these things here. So, so this was just about essentially explaining uh, the, the choice of the business model for SciPost, how, it's, how it was. And I, I like classifying things like that. And I like metal working as well. So I like to classify models for publishing based on certain metals. Yeah, so uh, gold is, uh, is essentially uh, these days uh, uh, more or less synonymous with APC-based financing. Now, this is not technically correct because what gold open access means uh, is really that you, uh, 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 you, can, you can have access from day one to the published content, irrespective of how this is achieved. Uh, but, uh, but these days, there's a kind of confusion among the community that says, oh, gold, that's when you pay to get access and things like that. So that's why I kind of uh, use it as synonymous because it's synonymous in the majority of people's heads. But there's better than that, right? So, uh, uh, so for me, uh, uh, there are some words that I like very much. I, I like platinum, palladium. It's, it's also a nice pho uh, photographic printing method <laughs> to, to, to use. So, so I define kind of platinum as uh, no charges being levied on the um, on the authors, and uh, palladium is about the whole operation being not for profit. And then to go further, you can talk about iron uh, publishing. This is really subscription based, kind of uh, back. And if you go really like on the poisonous route, then there's lead publishing. And this is where you've got uh, uh, an entanglement between the financial and the editorial. So think of predatory open access publishers that essentially take all the negative referee reports and throw them out the window, publish anyway, so that they can cash in on the APC. Uh, the APC model has really been guilty of creating a whole mushroom uh, industry of predatory journals like this. And you and I receive emails, countless emails of these uh, initiatives desperately trying to get a part of the pie, not worried about scientific quality whatsoever, just want to get the APCs. Yeah, so that's lead, uh, uh, lead category. Um, then you can go further and kind of look at the subclassification of really what they offer, what they do, what kind of complexity they, uh, uh, they attach to doing this or doing that. But let me, let me maybe jump over, jump over these things. The only thing I'd say is that I, I genuinely do believe that scientists overall, globally, they hold essentially the decisional power as to what this, uh, uh, where this whole thing goes. Um, I think if people were really uh, conscious of uh, all the business models of the publishers that they indeed publish with, referee for, or you know, the editors for, then uh, things might be very, very different. Uh, and I would uh, particularly encourage you to be careful of wolves in sheep's clothings, 
because there are many things that uh, profess to be, uh, you know, by and for academic uh, initiatives here and there, uh, but academics are simply used as front end to uh, another kind of dirtier business going on at the back. So I would really uh, uh, encourage you to look at the business models of uh, the systems you're, you're looking at, how, uh, uh, how they're structured, where the legal entity is, what the salaries are, the people at the head of that. Sometimes you might get some very interesting surprises. <laughs> So, but anyway, that's like a, a homework for you if you want to. So what's, what's our business model then? Let me just very briefly uh, explain it. The idea is that we've got no APCs. Uh, we're fully not-for-profit, so we're Palladium as well. And if I look at the operational costs that we have, they are in the ballpark of 400 euros per publication. Maybe 500 uh, this year, we'll see, because we've had some uh, 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 some kind of uh, expenditures for the future that we've had, but it's it's in this ballpark. Certainly not 4,000 like the averages. Um, the idea is that we want to function with a consortial model. Like I said, we view this as a global infrastructure that should be supported by the academic community, uh, by which I mean the universities, their libraries, funding agencies. And one of the inspirations for this is, of course, archive. So archive budget about 1.2 million a year. I think it's increased recently because of the upscaling under a couple of million per year. Uh, you only need crumbs from universities worldwide to come up with such a budget. And that's what Archive does. Of course, Cornell pays a bit more to stabilize it. They've got their logo on the homepage uh, uh, for that. But it's extremely cheap, uh, uh, worldwide distributed, no fees for usage. If you pull a PDF from the Archive, you don't pay anything. If you deposit your manuscript there, you don't pay anything either. They just look at, at usage. And uh, uh, they get a few thousand here, a few thousand there from a few universities and their budget is balanced. So that's what we want. Uh, the idea is that we're going to link the publishing activities to the desire for money that we will express to organizations. So we keep a tally for each paper that we publish of the organizations that are associated to this paper, either through author affiliations or through acknowledgements of research grants or things like that. And that allows us to essentially look at a, a digest of what happened. So we can say in a particular year, how many papers were associated to a certain organization. So that's the first aspect of it. So all this data is also available on the, on the site. You can just go to the organizations page and, and find it. Um, and then we've got a system that uh, uh, we call the pop fraction system to try to do some complicated accounting here. Okay, so it's like still in stabilization, but the general idea is that when you've got a paper, you've got many authors. So you've got many organizations associated to, to that paper. So really, if the paper costs you so much to, to produce, you should try to distribute these costs among the organizations. So upon publication, we distribute a unit, a, an imaginary unit associated with the publication between these organizations. And then each year, we can just look at the total operational expenditure of SciPost and essentially divided by the number of papers. So we know how much it costs us on average per paper, kind of not looking at finer detail than that. And then that means that we can tell each organization that if each organization was to contribute to SciPost, uh, the prorata of the activities like that, then we're good, we're stable, okay? So uh, this is just a, a model for a stable uh, uh, business model, not a model that grows, not a model which you know changes by 30% a year or whatnot. So that's the difficulty that we have. But morally, this is where we're going. Um, and then, yeah, so that's an example of a pop fraction distribution for a, for a publication. So you see for a particular university here, you're talking like 10% of what would be around uh, 400 euros. So for that particular paper, we're kind of expecting 40 euros from the Erwin Schrodinger uh, Institute. Okay. And then we compile that throughout a year, and then we can tell them uh, uh, the ballpark of what we need to, to survive. So, so we make these things visible, and then we, we hope for sponsorship. Now, uh, we've got a, 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 a list of sponsors that, uh, uh, that support us. It's about, it's almost 70 by now, I think, uh, depending on how you count. But we're looking at funders, uh, uh, you know, international funding agencies, national funding agencies, mostly universities and their libraries. Once in a blue moon, uh, a foundation can give us something. Sometimes we even have a private individual that says, you know, take this uh, little lump sum here because you're doing good here. So we had one private individual who gave us a very substantial amount of money. He gave us like 31,000 euros out of uh, their own pocket, uh, just because uh, they believe that we were doing a good job here. So, uh, so all these uh, these things we just throw into the publishing. 
Um, uh, you can find all the information about where the money comes from uh, uh, on our pages with the sponsors and the finances also. You'll find our expenditures, you'll find our, uh, uh, our outgoings, our incomes uh, in there as well. Everything is, uh, is completely open. So, so, so that's the idea of where we're going. Now, of course, if you want me to expand on the problems of this business model, then I can also, also do that because you see immediately that it is an extremely challenging model to use when you're trying to grow a business and when you're trying to stabilize a business because there is no obligatory payment from any of these organizations. Uh, there's a lot of uh, free riding that can occur where a university has lots of researchers publishing with SIPOS, but then when we approach them uh, uh, for sponsorship, they say, no, we don't need to pay. And anyway, we just gave all our money to Elsevier. Uh, so we get this answer most of the time. Uh, but the one like uh, response we have against that, we say, okay, fine. If that's what you say, that's what you say. But look, all this data is available publicly. So everybody sees that that's what you're doing. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, so the hope is that as people become more aware of this, um, uh, they will go there and check that their institution is okay. And what I would hope from scientists worldwide that make use of our services is that they go and check also. And if they notice that their university is not there, they pick up the phone and they just do a bit of a kind of rough conversation with their librarian <laughs> to set their priorities straight. And then, you know, it makes our life much easier because maybe next time this librarian will reserve uh, 2000 euros for side post that will cover all these expenditures for these people. Um, so uh, uh, the dream is to have such a model installed in a stable fashion, but in order to get there, the amount of diplomatic work, the amount of patience, the amount of rebuttals that we get, so uh, difficult. It would be so much easier to say, no, you know, from now on, we're just going to ask our authors to, you know, nature uh, charges uh, nine and a half thousand to go, uh, to go in now. Okay, fine. They, uh, what we're going to do, we're going to charge 2000 or something. And uh, uh, that would be so much easier. But I point blank use to ever do that. I will prefer to, you know, torpedo the whole thing just wrong. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so we'll see. But you see, um, I think the, the, the bet is kind of paying off because we are getting sufficient amounts of money to survive at the moment. And in very high level discussions about open access, about publishing, about the financing of this all, we are starting to be very seriously listened to. So it takes a long time for these new policies to be installed behind closed doors there's a lot of movement a lot of acknowledgement that the academic sector the uh, the public sector has been completely outlaid and outsmarted by the corporate for profit for profit publishers and that it's a situation where the client Okay, so uh, the thing is that one of the difficulties that the funders and universities have had in the past when they tried to shift finances away from, um, uh, from particular publishers is that there was a big reaction from scientists who said, no, you can't possibly uh, 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 prevent us from publishing in those places. And this is extremely problematic because many of these scientists were suffering from very serious conflicts of interest here. This was not put to the fore here. So I think the, uh, the responsibility of the academic community is also to act diligently in that sense and recognize the conflicts of interest and ask yourself whether the interests of the reform uh, of this uh, doesn't surpass the interests of particular academics who work for particular journals for particular conditions. Um, it's a difficult, um, difficult discussion to, to have. Yeah, but, uh, but we'll see. Anyway, so uh, uh, what, uh, what I'd like here is just to propose an alternative and hope it's picked up. Yeah, and if it's not picked up, fine. It's, uh, it's great to experiment with new publishing systems like that. If SciPost is not it, then fine, but I hope it will at least form uh, 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 about alternatives that can be built. Okay, 
Um, so, so let's just see. I mean, uh, I, I could talk about Plan S also, which is, uh, I'm, I'm sure you're all familiar with it. Uh, I, I've got, you know, good points and uh, bad points about this. Maybe I'll leave this for the discussion if you're, if you're interested. I had a nice uh, little video here about uh, metals. This, uh, I'm not gonna, even if it's a minute, I'm not gonna show it unless you ask it. This was Robert Jan Smits, who was really the instigator of Plan S. Some point uh, in a meeting, he kind of sang the praises of Cypos. So then I grabbed the video because I thought this was fantastic. And he was suggesting that Cypos was like a different kind of animal instead of calling it diamond, instead of calling it platinum, palladium, and so, you should call it rhodium. And then he gives a definition of it, but only if you're interested in metallurgy, yeah, I'll, I'll just skip on. Um, uh, also reactions to Plan S here, like I said, I'm very concerned by the, uh, uh, the reaction of some academics uh, very often with very severe conflicts of interest here. Uh, so I think uh, the, uh, my disappointment was that indeed fake news and hidden agendas are also rife in, uh, uh, in that side of academia. And I'm very disappointed by that. Uh, so, so, but still I remain hope, you know, more transparency is going to change this and we'll look back 10 years from now and not quite, but this was really happening here. So you can see. Um, that's it essentially. So that's the that's the team. Uh, so three people in the Cypost Foundation. Actually, uh, I'm the uh, uh, I'm the crazy person doing the uh, the programming. Uh, we just hired. So so Paula was our, uh, she, She's out on maternity leave for now. So we just hired two more starting this week, and and that's it. So I'll just uh, thank you for your attention and just open the floor for questions now and discussion if you want. Thank you very much, Jess. Uh, and uh, now is a, a, a time to ask questions. So, uh, yeah. And I'm happy to expand on any of the themes that have been discussed. Um, if you want. Yeah. All right. I already see a hand from Babak, please. Yes. Thank you. Um, a great presentation. Um, so just a maybe a comment and a question. Um, just from my own experience, uh, there is a lot of um, inertia moving, to, like even just submitting to Cypost. Uh, and some of it has to do with sort of old mentality and you know how people view publishing and you know, all of this um, branding uh, that comes with journal, different kinds of journals. Uh, but also, I see it in some of the younger scientists who would, I, I would have expected they would be more open to this. Uh, but, you know, a lot of those concerns about career and how, you know, things look on your CV and so on also trickle down. Um, so actually, so I've, I've, I've kind of experienced in my collaborations both sides of this uh, in trying to, say, submit even a paper to Cypress. Um so that, that's a comment. But the question is, so I, I tried to get involved with the editorial side of Cypress. And something that I've experienced both personally from my own side and also as may sort of see it maybe more generally, I don't know how widespread it is, is um, this volunteer sort of um, model of the editors who are knowledgeable and in principle can, can do the editorial side of things um, leads to some delays. Uh, it's hard sometimes to find editors or even when there is an editor, it's hard to find referees who will accept and so on. What, what is being done to address this? Yeah. So, so currently we're experiencing a lot of delays and uh, the problem is that it takes a lot of time to address these, uh, these things. I mean, that's why we've got like two new employees this week. It's to help me with this. And in a sense, it's a shot in the dark because we don't have the money to pay those people long term. So it's a, you know, cart before horse. So what, what happened uh, from about, I would say, June this, uh, this summer, there was a huge increase in the number of uh, submissions, registrations, and, and, and workflow. But there was no increase in personnel because there was no increase in income. So, uh, so we're facing a very difficult situation now. However, I believe in technological situations quite a lot. And we've been extremely hard at work, or you know, I've been extremely hard at work to build those systems that will accelerate everybody's workflow. So, so I, I'm I'm very happy to openly, absolutely openly acknowledge this. Uh, acknowledge this. During the last few months, there have been more delays at Cypost than we desire, 
and than other stable publishers will have. Um, and what I, what I like to remind people of is that uh, at Cypost, we, we go for open refereeing, right? So we put a lot of pressure on the authors and the referees because everything is visible. But, but in a sense, it cuts both ways because you see, if we don't process things fast enough, people also see that, <laughs> yeah? Um, uh, so uh, uh, once again, I mean, I think it's a question of openness and honesty. I'm all for open refereeing and I'm, I'm very happy to be openly refereed as well. <laughs> uh, so I, I can explain the reasons, I can explain what we are doing to try to address this and when these things are being rolled out and whatnot. Um, uh, and, you know, with, uh, 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 with many apologies to the community for the cases where sometimes, sometimes things get stuck, uh, uh, we are not blind. We do acknowledge, see those, and try to address them. But sometimes it's a difficult balance, you see, because we don't want to, we don't want to intimidate people either. Many of our fellows, for example, they say, no, no, I'm on it because I'm waiting for these two reports there. And these people have promised this to me. And uh, uh, but then you check again two weeks later and they say, no, I'm still waiting for the report. And then what do you do at the editorial administration? Do you say, no, no, let me find another editor in charge here <laughs> or let's do this. So it's a difficult balance. And I think one of the big things that we've uh, started implementing, but it's not fully done, is the idea of having a subset of fellows that we will call senior fellows that are, if you want, uh, primi inter pares, where they can intervene and unblock things. And also, if all goes well, there's going to be another feature released, if I can convince my team tomorrow, but they don't like my aesthetics of my new web page and things like that. So maybe it's going to take me a week or two, but there will be on the site from now on um, a direct way in which you can go to the submissions that are in delayed processing and see whether you as a contributor cannot offer a report that will unblock this. Okay, so, so this is being addressed, but certainly uh, uh, before you solve a problem, you have to acknowledge it. So I do acknowledge it. We at the moment have delays in the editorial processing. Thank you. Um, I uh, also have a question, and that's that's related to the uh, reforming aspect of Cypost. So there are, uh, you said you're you you're willing to to revisit many aspects of the publishing process. Um, so so I, I was discussing uh, during a discussion with colleagues at the Virtual Science Forum. Uh, I think one of us uh, us asked a question whether you consider uh, altern uh, alternative publication venues, for example, like shorter notes, the ones that do not qualify for a proper manuscript, but that could still be helpful to the community. Um, do you consider that a, uh, a useful application of SIPOST infrastructure and whether it fits into the scope? Uh, yes, absolutely. Because uh, uh, so uh, at, the, at the beginning of SciPost, I had installed also a different section called commentaries on the site. And I think this goes a little bit in the direction of what you're talking about, uh, at least in some particular case. So what are commentaries? These are comments that you can attach to any existing published object, uh, be that a SciPost object or at any other publisher. Uh, so, so think of the following scenario, uh, uh, an experimentalist has just installed a, a new lab and they are doing uh, replication experiments, just redoing uh, what somebody has already published in Nature and Science and gotten all the brownie points for. So this person you know, and their team, they, uh, uh, they go through the, the hoops, they, re they produce the data and the data kind of confirms the existing results or maybe not. <laughs> But in any case, uh, especially if they confirm the existing result, there's no material for a new publication there uh, uh, in the traditional way of doing publishing. However, uh, uh, it's important material because you want to see these replications, you want to get the, the material. So then this team could decide to just publish that as a commentary on the existing paper. They say, yeah, we looked at your paper, we read the experiment, that's what we got. <laughs> and then this object becomes a citable. Uh, the only thing is that this, uh, this object cannot be in a container journal, which will then be listed by Web of Science and Scopus. 
yeah because these companies hold the stranglehold of these things and they're not going to put that in their engines so uh, uh so as long as the community accepts that these are different types of, uh, of things then uh, then we can absolutely do that and you can already do that using the commentaries at Skypost. um so so that at least addresses some of the things uh that you could do with this and then you, you yeah, we'd be we'd be very happy to have a whole family of different um, uh, different things. In fact, also I had a whole palette of proposals for these things at the beginning, but um, I, I was told in no uncertain terms by many colleagues that if there was this whole palette from the beginning at SciPost, people wouldn't know anymore what SciPost was about. Is this a publishing place? Is this a dating agency? Is this like a bank? Uh, yeah. So yeah. So so you you gotta we want we want to make clear to the community that we are focused on excellence in publishing at the core and as it grows in time then you know if we feel that this is properly understood by the community then we're very happy to add stuff like that it's very simple the machines are almost available for all these things so yes thanks um, perhaps you, you brought up uh, the reaction of uh, of your colleagues to the in, to 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 the initial ideas, and that's also something that I wondered about. Um, can you tell a few words about how SciPost started? How did you find how did you find the first uh, submitters and the first board members? Uh, when would when did you think SciPost have got uh, have obtained enough momentum? Can you tell about the early days? Yeah, yeah. So the, uh, I mean, the very early days uh, are, so, um, I mean, uh, I've been in academia for a while, right? So I'm just, uh, I'm just about to hit uh, 50. So I've been in academia for now multiple decades, I can say. And um, uh, of course, first as an author, then as a referee, and then also as a, an editor for various journals, member of the board, sometimes, you know, having responsibilities there. So I saw the system from all sides. And I developed a number of question marks on certain things that I was seeing. But I think um, uh, one of the trigger moments for me was at some point, uh, I had a very, very good research result that I, I thought was like the best in like 10 years or something in what we had done. And uh, uh, we had obtained that in a team of, uh, with three others. And I was very proud of that. So, so then we thought, you know, this is, this is so good. We're gonna aim to the top. So we're going to send that to you know the very uh, glossiest glossy you can think of, and uh, of course it's like theoretical condensed matter physics. So uh, so the editors wrote back, kind of saying you know you must be joking. Yeah, we don't do that here. <laughs> so then we started tumbling down, and each time we tumbled down uh, from one place to another, we were changing journal. So we had to reformat the paper. We had to rewrite the thing to different standards and whatnot. And at some point after we had tumbled down uh, three places, I uh, computed the time we had taken to write and rewrite and rewrite the paper as compared to the time we needed to do the research. And the time to do the rewriting was now exceeding the time to do the research. And I said, this is utterly unacceptable. So you need to have this openly refereed. It's very important that this is not closed door referee. Uh, so you want openness and refereeing. And then I started being more and more like vocal about this. And that's right. okay sorry sorry so then it's very simple is that this colleague uh, i was talking about you know publishing and things like that and this colleague got kind of fed up and said look js either uh, you, you talk so much about publishing either you shut up or you do something about it and then you know so uh, so that was maybe the kind of uh, one of the trigger moments uh, to do this so so i started coding in uh, in the autumn of 2015 and had a, a, a release version ready in in february of uh, 2016 and then finally in April 2016 uh, the site was opened up and then there was a lot of diplomatic work indeed to um, explain the idea to lots of colleague scientists uh, as to why they should help initiate this thing and then that's how we kind of gathered the 10 papers for the inaugural issue in September 2016 uh, uh, but there was a lot of diplomatic work a lot of explaining of where this was going a lot of comforting people that this was not just a kind of one month uh, uh, fad, that this was going to stay. So that was uh, tough work. Yeah. And now hopefully people are less worried about that now that we've been around for like five years. <laughs> so. um, 
Yeah, right. So about, about that, um, so I take it that now you're uh, you're uh, optimistic about the future of Cypost. Uh, was there a uh, a point in time where you said, okay, we achieved enough enough, uh, uh, we passed a threshold of sustainability, popularity, something, or or is that not how you view it? Not really, uh, because I, uh, uh, you know, Cypost today, as compared to uh, the kind of idea I have in my mind of what it could be, of course, it's nowhere near, uh, because uh, there are too many limitations, and the, the, the big, there are two choking points, two strangleholds, and that is the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the stubborn uh, uh, use of uh, metrics engines like Web of Science and Scopus for evaluation. This is the absolute killer. It is designed to kill off new initiatives like this. It is deliberately used by these publishers to kill off new initiatives and very, very effectively. And in order to survive this, you have to agree that you can, you have to be four years at minimum underwater, not able to breathe. Yeah, so you have to have your reserves to stay four years underwater. So this is, uh, I find personally, a totally unacceptable barrier to progress in the publishing industry, but I cannot change it because scientists are still asking the question, what's your impact factor on this? Yeah, so, so in a sense, it's a, it's a force of habit. So that's the, that's the first thing. And the second problem also, the second growth limitation is of course financial. There's no money. And I can't go to the bank and ask for, you know, a 10 million grant to, to scale up this thing because I've got no guaranteed income. So there's no, it's not a business anyway. It's, not, it's the whole point is that it's not a business. Yeah. But there's no, uh, there's no funding agency that will give us this, uh, uh, this kind of money because, you know, they don't do that. They will, however, do that to an established player, <laughs> just not with us. Yeah. Which is completely, it, it's extremely frustrating. So if you want, I feel like we, we're like the startup, we're like the, the thing that can really grow like a startup, but because we're not a financially you know, profitable or profit-making startup, uh, we're not gonna get the money. Uh, so, uh, so we have to do it without the money. And once it's done, hope that we get enough money to survive. So these are extremely, uh, if these two problems were not there, Cypost could easily be a hundred times bigger today than it uh, than it is. Um, all right. Are there any questions from the participants? Yes, I see a hand, Victoria. Ah, uh, hello. Uh, I have a question related to what I've seen on forum uh, of Cypost. Uh, suddenly, <laughs> there was discussion about uh, there will be the list of the best uh, publications. Uh, which will be kind of um, overview of news in the field. And then reading these publications, you will have understanding what's going on in the field. So the question is who will uh, select uh, what is the main uh, result in the field and uh, why? Yeah, so these, uh, so all such decisions are delegated, delegated to the editorial college as a community. So they would be the ones who would have to actively uh, put forward something on this. So we, uh, uh, if you want all the decisional power, all the editorial power is entirely delegated to the college as a whole. So, uh, so you would have, you know, uh, uh, sub communities of specialist fellows deciding on these things in each specialty of a certain field. Yeah. Which but that's like, me <laughs> sorry, that's like maybe like two people or so and they probably have some biases of what is important, what is not, and maybe yeah. not, uh, I mean, sometimes it can be efficient in the field, sometimes not. So it's kind of a little bit, um, I don't know, I, I, I'm, I'm having questions about that. So it's, it's, it's much more than two. So each decision in principle has got 10 people in, in, in implied in it. And for each case, this set of people is varied. So it's, uh, uh, if you want, uh, 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 it's algorithmically designed to make it as difficult as possible to form clubs <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, uh, subsets of things, but it's difficult to completely avoid. Yeah. 
So, uh, uh, but if you want, uh, because on, on the one hand, we would like every single fellow to look at every single submission, but then it doesn't scale. So we have to put the scale somewhere. And uh, uh, if we put the scale at two, then it's too easy to have things go out of control like you suspect. If we put 10, it's much, much more difficult uh, to, uh, to have these clubs form. But, uh, uh, but this is in need of constant monitoring and you know, checking. And here, actually, our senior fellows would really help with this as well, because they would be the ones to... Like, yeah, but, you know, I, I've things. dealt with many senior fellows in my life. <laughs> and they also have clubs and their, their favorite students, not favorite students. It's uh, Sometimes it's better yeah. to have just young researchers than the senior fellows who have this tree. Senior, this person senior gets here. the position, this person gets money, and this person gets something. Yeah. Uh, but whatever, it, it, I, it was a question, just a question. Thank you. It's a, it's a constant concern. And here I would like to emphasize that the, the word senior is not used in terms of age here. So uh, somebody uh, would be selected as a senior fellow uh, after showing you know, very good work as a fellow, like things done on time, proper invitations, proper handling of things. Then this person is clearly atop, uh, you know, atop of their game and they can help others do a similar job. And that could very well be a relatively young person. Yeah. Okay. In fact, in fact, the older fellows that we have are typically the ones that, you know, with exceptions, but you know, the younger fellows we have, let me say it like that, the younger fellows that we have typically function better and therefore have a bigger chance of becoming senior fellows. <laughs> okay, okay, thank you. All right. Uh, are there any other questions? Um, I yes. have a quick question. So, how, how does the so it looks like the volume of papers publications in Cyprus is increasing? And yeah, uh, how does this compare to some other journals? You know, not PRB or you know that publishes I don't know a lot, but something small. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so I mean, it, it really depends on which uh, which subfield you're talking about. So, so just to give you some numbers, um, uh, I think uh, uh, we're going to break uh, uh, at approximately 400 publications for this year, 2021. Uh, about 80% of those will be in Cypost physics for the moment, although this percentage is going to, of course, decrease in the course of time because we're growing the other things. Um, the, the growth rate is approximately 30% per year at the moment in physics. Um, uh, we'll have to see what happens with uh, chemistry and astronomy, but uh, I, I'm not sure we can uh, maintain 30% a year in physics for the, the coming years. And anyway, we're not aiming for a growth rate. We're just aiming to you know, have stable operations. The thing that we're that we're hoping is that um, uh, Cypost physics will float up in you know level and recognition because we've kind of cranked up the conditions and we still have to crank them up further. So, for example, Anton is a great advocate for accessibility of code, accessibility of all the data underlying everything. Um, uh, in principle, now if you look at uh, the conditions, you have to do that in, in all Cypost publications. But we we're not in a position to completely implement that because we would refuse most papers. <laughs> so we have to do a, a kind of education thing. But that said, we're cranking up the conditions, and the hope is that Cypost Physics will kind of float up to be the direct competitor to Nature Physics. Um, uh, that's the objective, and then Cypost Physics Core becomes the kind of substitute for more physical review ABCD like level replacement and things that don't make it into that uh, would have to go in a different container. Yeah, so uh, small replication studies and things like that, they would have to do, they would have to land in a different container than the ones we have at the moment. Um, so um, so the, the scale that we have, uh, I think if you, uh, uh, if you look at the growth rate of PRX, for example, it's been similar, but of course the machinery is very, very different. And anyway, of all the publishers out there, I think that the last ones we want to you know, uh, kill off or whatever are APS. Of course, I, I disagree with the salaries that they give to their people and whatnot, 
But in principle, I think if, um, if the APS editors reread the statutes of the APS and kind of acted upon those statutes, then APS would be fantastic. I think the slight problem with APS in the last few years is that in order to compete with the big corporate publishers, they have become maybe a little bit too much like them. Yep. So you should go back to the community. But in terms of, in terms of growth rate, it's, it's similar. Thank you. All right. Um, I think uh, I think it's time to wrap up. So, uh, Jess, once again, thank you very much for the talk, and uh, thanks uh, everyone for joining. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, if you need more information about anything, don't hesitate to get in touch. I'm always happy to uh, uh, do my best to provide the information you need. So.